Kia ora, Talofa, Namaste, Haremai, and welcome to this week's episode of the Niche Cache Variety Show. Big up Aotearoa, big up Aotearoa Sport. We are here for a smorgasbord of Aotearoa Sporting Action Wildcard. We don't have Stephen Adams on the agenda today, but I, I'm feeling good about my analogies and my connection with some of these Aotearoa sporting topics and a few weeks ago I, re I referred to Stephen Adams as the fulcrum of the Memphis Grizzlies basketball team in the NBA. Do you have any Stephen Adams updates on what he's been up to over the last week or so with the Memphis Grizzlies and if you can confirm that he is in fact the fulcrum for the Memphis Grizzlies? I think fulcrum's a, a pretty great way to describe it actually because it's like the like how a fulcrum works it's the um it's like well, i was going to do that thing where you describe the word by using the word itself if the fulcrum is the fulcrum of the machine like mm. um it is but that's also not the best explanation but it's like the bit that leverages everything else upwards um that feels extremely Stephen Adamsy. Like he's not necessarily going to be the guy who gets the spotlight and he's not necessarily going to be the guy who like does the most important stuff but he's the guy who facilitates the guys who do the most important stuff like he is Jamarand's best source of points this season so far and one of the, the pretty much the same last season but this season's been really emphasized like they're going to that well even more than ever the the screen games as much as anything it's like that Jamarand is as fast as any point guard in the league at getting around the like you beat the first man he's going to get to the basket he's too quick and he finishes so well how do you get around the first man strong screen who does that better than anyone in the nba steven adams like i, I think fulcrum is kind of a perfect way to describe it and that's what you've seen from him so far is just like even more recognition i think within the grizzlies organization of how important he is and the, you see that from the way that they play the plays that they run these kind of things um, whether that's seen outside the Grizzlies organization and outside of Aotearoa, where we're keeping a close eye on these things, doesn't really matter because everyone can see how good Ja Morant is. And if Ja Morant knows that Stephen Adams is important to that, that Stephen Adams isn't going anywhere. You know, he's, he's staying, working very closely with Ja Morant if that's the case. And it is the case. So whether Stephen Adams is recognized elsewhere is not the important thing because he's going to keep getting to do what he does regardless. As you discussed that, and as I um, conjured images of the fulcrum in my mind, as I'm looking at the Black Caps T20 World Cup stats in front of me, I'm going out on a limb, and this isn't my uh, official banger of a take to start with, but I this one might come into contention over the coming weeks. I believe Kane Williamson is the Black Caps fulcrum. And everything you just said about Stephen Adams, Ja Morant, outside perspective perspective from the homies i think kane williamson is the black caps fulcrum and he is the uh, connective tissue of the black caps batting lineup we went deep into black caps t20 world cup matters for the patreon podcast so check that out patreon.com forward slash our niche case for the patreon whanau that podcast is live for you there and if you do wish to support the niche case and all of our content the website blogs the podcast the emails as well email newsletters via substack any way you uh anything you like from the niche cache the best way to support it is via patreon patreon.com forward slash our niche cache and we do an extra podcast for the patreon whanau every week so check that out this week uh, we did have a question from one of our patrons mark lumpy about plunket shield cricket as well and then we spent the rest of the podcast discussing black caps t20 world cup cricket specifically but a buzz for the game against england tonight tuesday night so hopefully they win that game and it'll be just uh keep this uh fantastic aotearoa sporting vibe rocking and rolling Shout out to the email newsletter every Monday and Friday. We send that out via Substack, the nichecase.substack.com. It always has insightful nuggets about Aotearoa sport. The Monday Dispatch, I dropped uh, three things about Aotearoa Breakers basketball wildcard, dabbled in a bit of basketball. Uh, writing there, I laid out some Aotearoa Kiwis Rugby League World Cup 
stuff that I'm going to use for the variety show today, as well as uh, we had some black sticks, hockey, the wild card. Men's or women's team of the week yesterday? Women's? Women's won this week, yeah. What else did you have there? Um, the Marco Rojas? But the Marco Rojas was there. Um, I think there was some some sort of quick reaction thoughts on the, the latest football fern squad and there was something else. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> I'm sure There's always some else in there. beautiful Aotearoa sporting content in those email newsletters. Thenichecase.substack.com Enter your email address in. That comes to you every Monday and Friday evening full of Aotearoa sporting information that you require. And big up to the website, Ting. The niche case.com, fresh yarns all the time. Done a big, uh, got black caps yarns, lots of that. Plunkers shield yarns, they come out thick and fast during uh, the latter stages of each round. Flying Kiwis will be up. National League roundups will be up as well. Kiwi fans are staying in the Rugby League World Cup campaign, so we'll touch on that. Lots of Aotearoa sporting yarns on our website, the niche case.com. Wildcard mindfulness it up yeah <laughs> i'll mindfulness it up as this is um actually a, bit, a little bit different to normal this is a thought that came into my head while i was running the auckland half marathon on sunday morning i was doing that thing where i was like even though i know this is annoying for myself to do because it's you know i i tend to run without like um you know, I don't have one of them watches or anything or that's telling me how far I've gone or how what my time is or whatever. I just want to like run away from all that stuff. But then sometimes I can't help but try to like figure out, well, okay, there was the 6K marker. Where's the 7K marker? How close am I to the blah, blah, blah. I was doing that kind of thing. Um, and then getting annoyed at myself because then uh, you get to the feeling of like, oh, it's, uh, I must be nearly done this kilometer by now. And then, oh, I'm not. And you just get bad vibes starting to permeate and there's going to be enough Hit of those noise. later on in the race head noise is a great way to describe it and then a uh, three simple words popped up into my head while i was trying to figure this out when i don't know and i thought you know what that's that that's the way to be like sometimes you just got to be like i don't know i'm not going to figure this out i don't know it, it doesn't matter um it, sometimes i don't know means like I don't know. I should ask. I should. I don't know. I should look this up. I should figure this out. Sometimes I don't know means it's futile to try and know. So don't even worry about it. There's many times where each of those different pathways, but I think sort of, you know, there's probably a few too many opinions out there in the in the world right now, held by a few too many people, just in general. Or it applies to all of us. Like just everyone wants to be an expert on too many different things. Sometimes you just got to sit back and be like. I don't know. And it's a lot healthier. <laughs> it's a lot easier. You beat yourself up a whole lot less if you just sit there and say, I don't know. I know one thing, Wildcard. <laughs> I know one thing for certain. You're allowed to know one thing. That's fine. I know absolutely one thing for certain. I was crafting this for a couple of months. And I think it's elevated my test batting average with Aotearoa sporting takes up to up to 35 like i think we're just rocking around 35 um but a consistency is found a couple of big knocks a couple of uh yarns that have proven to be telling and i know one thing for certain wildcard and that is that glenn phillips is the most exciting cricketer in the world just like the fact that i thought about that before the world cup and then he took the catch against against Australia. And then he scored some runs against Sri Lanka. Glenn Phillips is the most exciting cricketer in the world. And if you want to do a deep dive on this, check out the latest Black Caps yarn on the, our website, the thenewstashcase.com, where I broke down Glenn Phillips' uh, Caribbean Premier League and T20 Blast stats all of which are as good as any other batter in the world. And of course, Glenn Phillips is also the most exciting cricketer in the world as well. Are you feeling as uh, prophetic as I am, Wildcard? Um, I, I don't know if I'm going with the prophecy so much this week. Uh, otherwise, I would try to. It just reminds me that it was actually Glenn Phillips' 100 that I wrote about in the... Um, 
the other bit that I forgot about in the email. And I'm luckily um, talking about that in a little bit on. So nice Glenn Phillips theme to this one. No, I want to, I just want to say that I think the Wellington Phoenix are still very good. And I don't think people should worry about the four games without a win so far. Um, it's not ideal, but I think we saw despite some like disjointedness, despite a bit of sloppiness, I think over the first few weeks, it has to be acknowledged that they, are, that they are embedding quite a few new players into the system. That is how it can kind of go. And most importantly, that game against Melbourne City on the weekend away in Melbourne, the fact they came from 2-0 down, making some couple, you know, first half, let's be honest, like goals that they could have prevented, their own mistakes led to them against a really good team, like potentially the best team in the A-League. But digging themselves a little bit of a hole, playing into some of the problems that they've had over the first, first few weeks. Not ideal. Um, but to see them claw back and force a draw from there, I think it's pretty... Um, I don't know. I think that's a catalyst for the rest of the season, especially when you consider that every time they conceded first last season, they went on to lose. Here they conceded first. 2-0 down, in fact. Came back and drew two wall. Talai made significant changes to his team for this game. He later subbed on the likes of uh, Bozidar Krajev, Kosta Barbarusa, Steven Yugakovic, and got a positive response out of all of those guys in particular. That's great coaching. Um, they do have to start winning soon. Like You can't let the slide last too much longer. But that result in Melbourne, I think, reconfirms a few crucial things. One is that the Knicks have a really good coach in Ufuk Talai who knows how to motivate and get the best out of his players. Um, another one is that the Knicks have increased strength and depth this year, and that gives them option. It gives them competition for places, and that should drive um, higher standards as well. Uh, as I say, the two goals they conceded, sparked by their own errors, got to fix that. But the two they scored show that this team does have the heart to push on and hopefully end up with a finals game later in the season, because that's what I predicted before the season. So I guess there is a prediction involved here. Um, before the season, I said I, I want to see this team finish in the top four, get a home semi final. I, despite them not winning any of their first four games, they've drawn three of them. The point away at Melbourne City was pretty impressive. And I I still think that's a completely realistic target. I reckon Warriors fans should be tapped in with Wellington Phoenix and New Zealand Breakers right now because if both of those teams hold down a position top four-ish, top five-ish, upper echelon of their respective leagues, I think Warriors fans should be uh, doing a bit of uh, magical manifestation work themselves as well, considering how impressive the Breakers and Phoenix have been to start this season. Well, it's been a while since the Breakers were top the semi-final team, but this is the year that, that might be turning around. So, Yeah, of Warriors fans are in no position to yeah I know it is. Any further right like <laughs> that's, um, that's a very appropriate point. Statistical funk here, Wildcard. I just want to highlight some Aotearoa Kiwis matters and update things how they've been tracking three games, three different spine combinations, three different center combinations, three different edge forward combinations. All twenty four players were used. None of that is conducive with slick footy so no surprises like i've seen the word clunky used to describe the kiwis footy a lot over the past few weeks it's like no shit sherlock the spine's been different for every game right like the edge defense uh has been different every game the edge combinations have been different every game two players have played every game there might be more but these two players stand out joey manu and brandon smith brandon smith has played 80 minutes in two of the three games and 71 minutes in the other game so obviously joey manu is going to play big minutes um, but brandon smith is also churning out the minutes your stat here wild card is about glenn phillips it is uh because he scored 104 against Sri Lanka and it was incredible and it was a match winning knock and he is the world's most exciting cricketer that was actually his second international 2020 century um I'm just going to talk about a bunch of his 2020 century and uh, heroics here because he also got 108 against the West Indies in 2020 famous knock um bit of a breakthrough knock for him I'd say with the Black Caps also famous knock for his um his dodgy kneecaps if you remember that one it was <laughs> I think a lot of people remember most about that, even above and beyond his incredible century there. 
So two international T20 tons, there have only ever been 10 2020 international hundreds by Black Caps batters. Colin Munro has three of them. Martin Guptill, Brendan McCullum, and now Glenn Phillips have two of them. And the other one was uh, young Mr. Finallen against Scotland not so long ago, a couple months ago. Um, the international record for Rohit Sharma. So already, uh, already Glenn Phillips is halfway there. And there's actually only one other dude along with Colin Munro who has three, and that's Glenn Maxwell. So he's tied for fourth most. There's not that many people who have multiple 2020 international hundreds. But Glenn Phillips doesn't only do this internationally. He actually has two super smash hundies for Auckland as well. And it's a little bit hard to find some of these stats sometimes. But as far as I can tell, I, I think the only two people, the only other two people who have multiple super smash hundreds are Devin Conway and Brendan McCullum. So also very good company. And you mentioned there's... Um, you mentioned him doing some stuff in the in the email at the... Uh, what's it, the T T20 Blast? It's called A in England. Didn't score 100 there, but he did score 100 for Barbados in the CPL one time in the Caribbean Premier League. So add that all together, he has five, uh, well, it's not first class, is it? But let's say five professional 2020 centuries in his career. Long way off the record, which is Chris Gale, who had 22 of the buggers, which is quite incredible, especially incredible when you consider that second on the list is eight. <laughs> Chris Gale scored 22 um 2020 hundreds nobody else has more than eight the eight are three australian guys michael klinger as well as david warner and aaron finch brennan mccullum is seven he's the new zealand record there are only 12 players in history with more than five so six or more and glenn phillips is i mean <laughs> he's got five already and here's the thing about glenn phillips he's 25 years old he turns 26 in december there's plenty more where this came from as you'd expect from the most exciting cricketer in the world, deep in the mango. Only getting more exciting. We are going deep into Plunkett Shield cricket. And I got five things about Plunkett Shield cricket um, from the first two rounds. First thing is at the top of the test batting order, where Tommy Latham, two games, two centuries. Shout out to him. His test batting opening partner, Will Young has two 50s and three innings. And that's just what Will Young does. Like, Tommy Latham, I think he's one of the best batters in the world, so he's just doing what he does. And I think he also had two centuries in two games last year as well. Um, Will Young just kind of cruises along, just getting 50s every two or three innings. That's what he does. So two test openers are scoring runs in Plunkett Shield. That's nice. Thorn Parks, Otago batter. Playing, I think he, the first round of Plunkett Shield was his second first class game. I think he made his debut last season. He's got three 50 plus scores in three innings, which seems rather impressive. The only other batters who have scored over three innings is just one singular Henry Cooper, Northern District's opener. But he has batted four innings. So Henry Cooper's got a century and two half centuries and four innings. Thorn Parks has three innings, three half centuries. So just track the old uh, Thorn Parks down there in Otago. He's looking pretty good. Black Caps seamers are also interesting here, Wildcard, because Jacob Duffy has ventured into the Black Caps realms over the last few years. He is leading all wicket takers with 17 wickets. Average of 14, rounded up to 15. Matt Henry is second for wickets. 14 wickets at an average of 11. So two highly, not highly because Duffy has been up and down it throughout his career, but his recent work, like he's swinging the ball, he's moving the ball. I think he's got a bit of that Black Caps development bump where he can move the ball both ways just with the skill set from tim Southern and trent bolt working on that also seems to be bowling um quite aggressively as well which is good matt henry dominates all plunkett shield cricket so the test openers are scoring runs in plunkett shield cricket as we'd hope they'd do two black capsy swing seam bowlers are also performing well 
as is Matt Fisher, and I continue to be interested in Matt Fisher. Slick. Seamer for Northern Districts, and he is fourth for wickets. He's got 10 wickets at an average of 15.6. Also, there's a couple of fast bowlers around Aotearoa. I think Sean Davey seems to be bowling pretty quick. He's got eight wickets at 19 average. Um, ben Sears hasn't been heavily deployed. I think he missed the first game. Might have played the second game, but didn't get too many overs. So there are quite some quick seamers around Aotearoa as well to keep an eye on. Last Plunkett Shield thing here, Wildcard, is just who who is going to be the best spinner. Ajaz Patel is the incumbent test spinner. Michael Rippon's playing for Otago. Joe Walker toured India A with Aotearoa A as well. He's uh, the lead spinner for Northern. Rachin Ravindra is pretty much the lead spinner for Wellington as well. Because old uh, young husband hasn't played a whole lot right now. You've got Ashok and Somerville for Auckland. I think you're like Canterbury, you're getting a lot of Cole McConchy, those type of characters bowling their, their spin. But East Sodi might return from the T20 World Cup and come back into Canterbury's team if the Plunkett Shield's still trucking along by then. So I am curious. Everyone kind of assumes AJ Patel's the best long form spinner in Aotearoa. Right now, leading wicket taker for spinners is Michael Rippon with seven wickets. And Will Somerville also has seven wickets. So I'm just curious who will stand up and say, I am the best spinner in Aotearoa, because that's kind of what the Black Caps need. Test team, anyway. Deep in your mangroves wildcard. Yeah, so last week I ventured deep into the mangroves and produced some mid-season Women's National League awards. We're now roughly in the mid-season. I think we're just slightly after it now for the for the men's competition. So in the interest of equality, I'll do uh, the mid-season awards for the men's National League as well. And starting with the MVP, which I'm going to award mid-season MVP to Jack Henry Sinclair of Wellington Olympic. Shouldn't be too much of a surprise if anyone who's seen olympic play this season they're just like sizzlingly good on attack heaps of pace and so much of it is coming through um jack henry sinclair up that right wing scoring goals setting goals up he's been untouchable um he is the mvp through the first five weeks um rookie of the season so far I had to think about this a little bit because there are quite a few uh good young players i, I really like corbin piper in midfield for, for birkenhead but I've decided to go with Joe Lee of Auckland City. Um, Kiwi Korean uh, heritage. I believe he's um, very left-footed, plays on the right wing for Auckland City, has pretty much cracked into that. Uh, it's like a, a really impressive... Like he's, he's playing in a front three alongside dudes like um, Ryan DeFries and Emiliano Tade and, and Angus Kilcolly and Dylan Manicum and dudes like this. He's like 20 years old, ho holding his own... Anytime he can chop in and shoot, he looks dangerous. He's a great dribbler. He's fast. He takes defenders on. He's great fun to watch. Um, so Joe Lee's the rookie of the year. So far, most improved, who are both younger slightly than the rookie, but that's that's how these things go. Um, did have to think about this, but I've gone with a tie between Dan Mackay and Finn Conchi from the Wellington Phoenix, who are their two central midfielders. So uh, like they've they've played at least a season before at this level, they've both looked solid, good, reliable players this year. They've just leveled up to a point where it's like, they've been fantastic. They're setting up goals. They're covering ground. Their, their passing is really good, really like strong. Um, uh, what's the word? Um, rhythmic passing sort of thing. They're moving the ball from defense, getting it forward. Um, both of them were with the New Zealand under-19s team recently that won the Oceania Champs. I think they've both been fantastic. Dan Mackay and Finn Conchi, coach of the year so far. I think it's hard to go past Rupert Kimmies of um, Wellington Olympic. They are top of the table after five weeks, thanks to Auckland City's loss on the weekend. They 
did narrowly lose to Auckland City, but gave them a big threat in week one and probably a little, you know, there's a disallowed goal that was a bit controversial, probably a little bit frustrated they didn't get something else after that. And since then, they've just scored goals galore against every team they've played. They have the best defensive record and they have the best attacking record. They play the best football, um, in my opinion, and therefore their coach is the coach of the year at the midseason point. And finally, defensive player of the year was tough to think about like it was after a couple of weeks that had gone with connor tracy of auckland city um did wonder about some of those other city guys i think ben Mata and and justin gully have both both missed a game or two for wellington olympic which might have swung things had they been playing every game i've gone with curtis mogg um from auckland united who as an ex-Phoenix player, in fact, he used to captain the Phoenix um, Academy team, was with the senior Phoenix team throughout last season, although he never played an A-League game. He did play in the FFA Cup. I think the thing that sticks him apart from everyone else is just that consistency of doing this every single week. And he's, he's playing for a team that isn't quite as strong as City or, or Olympic. Um, so they just beat, <laughs> they just beat uh, City and they play Olympic next week, I think. I just think he's been fantastic. He looks, despite the fact that he's only probably 21 years old, he looks like a dude who is like a 28-year-old veteran who's played several years in the A-League, stepping back to the National League and just being like, I'm better than this and I'm going to dominate you all. He's you know great in the challenge, reads the game well, distributes the ball nicely, I think. He has been, for consistency of doing that every week in particular, he's, he's the defensive player of the mid-season. So... There you go. Um, Mid-season Men's National League's awards in the back. I think Tommy Latham's also thinking I'm better at this than everyone else. hundred percent. And I am yeah. going to dominate you. I love it when dudes do that, though. Uh, you love it when they drop back to the domestic level and just like, I'm not here for a holiday. <laughs> like, I'm here to pad my stats and be amazing and boots like take this forward. That is one of the most important things when you're Sure. Over in the domestic uh, kind of level of sport. I've actually got two questions here, Wildcard. And I'll start with uh, a Flying Kiwis question because we've had uh, Marco Rojas, well in. Might as well get the, the triple banger name out there. Champion of Chile. Um, that gave me a few goosebumps. And Marco Staminich playing in the Champions League also gave me some Aotearoa sporting goosebumps as well. My first question, is there anything else on your Flying Kiwis beat this year that has given, I don't know, maybe you didn't get goosebumps from any of these situations, but um, is there something of similar ilk as regard in terms of like epic, goosebumpy Aotearoa footballing moments? Well, Staminich getting Champions League games was like 15 years in the making and then he went above and beyond by starting a couple of them and looking real good actually and like getting a draw with City so there's like there's nothing on that scale because how could like one in 15 year occurrence kind of thing um Marco Rojas might have been back in the crowd a little bit as sort of a relatively bit part player in their title thing until he came off the bench, set up a goal, and then scored from nearly halfway um, in the game after they'd clinched the title, but it was their first home game afterwards. So it was the game where they were going to get the trophy, right? So just the last kick of the game, he scores from almost halfway. Everyone celebrates him. That leads directly into a trophy presentation. That was incredible. So nothing on that level. That's yeah, goosebumps and then some for that. But three other ones that I've highlighted that from just recent months that I think are up there. I think Anna Leeds debut for, for Aston Villa, where she saved four penalties in a shootout against Manchester United, just definitely up there. That was a pretty incredible feat, I think. Um, uh, Alex Grieve, I think twice, um, he's come off the bench and scored a, a late winner for St. Mirren, and in particular once quite recently, where he came, it was like an 89th minute winner that he scored to get them the victory after they'd conceded a, an equalizer about 20 minutes earlier. That's pretty incredible stuff. I loved seeing that kind of thing. That's the the late drama version of the Goosebumps rather than the like trophy laden version. Um, and so let's chuck in Jackie Hand as well. Her first season in professional football went great in uh, in Finland for Ireland United, um, just in Ireland off of Finland. But there you go. And I think they had their first. I think like she scored a bunch of goals, set up a bunch of goals, had a really good season, but also. Um, 
also contributed to them getting their highest league finish for a couple of years, and they won the cup competition. And she set up a goal in the final. And there's a photo from Flying Kiwis that week of them getting like the champagne bottle out to celebrate. And she's like leaning over while the coach just pours champagne in her face. Um, and then she missed the football ferns game immediately afterwards with an injury, which maybe was just an extended hangover. But um, she came back and finished her, finished off her season. We'll see her for the footy ferns in a couple of weeks' times in, um, in Christchurch, actually. So there's, there's three of those there. Um, question in return. We talked a bit about this as like the Black Caps were back in their comfort zone as the underdogs gone into the 2020 World Cup. And they've been really good. Are the Black Caps still the underdogs? We actually twisted it around to Dark Horse. Yeah, we did too. Which did too, seems right. more suitable for the Black Caps situation. But to your point, to your question, if the Black Caps make the semi final, I'm confident they will be viewed as the underdog for that semi final. And I think that answers the question. Despite the, being an amazing T20 team, whoever they play in the semi-final, I think they are going to be underdogs. And as funny as that is from a Kiwi perspective, of course, we can't be surprised because everyone kind of sleeps on Aotearoa sport to some extent. One last question, Wildcard. When you're talking about some uh, men's national league, but of Wellington Phoenix, you reminded me that I was quite impressed with Sam Sutton playing left back for the Wellington Phoenix. And is it Ben Old? Yeah, Ben Old. Yep. He was also, he also right caught my wing. eye. We discussed, uh, we had discussed them with Ben Wayne um, in a previous podcast. So my question that I've just made up right now is, was I correct? in my assessment of uh, Sam Sutton and Ben Old looking quite impressive against the Melbourne City team. Yeah, for sure. Um, Go me. Sutton scored one goal and, and Old set up the equaliser. So <laughs> that alone is impressive. But I think I was surprised that Ben Old stayed on, not because I didn't think he was having a good game, but just because I thought maybe you leave Ben Wayne on there. And then, um, but you could see why it's because he wanted to bring on Savada and he also wanted to play Costa Barbarouses up front rather than out wide. And guess what? That, worked because if Costa Barbarouses was out wide, wouldn't have been up front for Ben Old, who would have otherwise been on the bench to set him up for the equalizing goal. So for Talai knows best as always. Um yeah, I thought Old had his best game of the season, definitely. Um I I was hoping based on what I saw from the FFA Cup that this would be a bit of a breakthrough season for him where you start to see him uh, look more comfortable at this level, set up a few more goals and, and that kind of thing. And this is a good start to that. I think Sam Sutton already has had that breakout season last year. And again, really good on the weekend and scored a fantastic strike for that, for the first goal that got them back into the game and led to the, to the, like sparked the comeback. So um, I, Ben Old's already played for the All Whites and I think Sam Sutton will probably be in the next squad whenever they next play. I, I suspect he's right there on the fringes um they're great players yeah they're two excellent prospects coming through and sort of after ben wayne you can sort of like every year there's one dude who stands out from the academy team like it was sapreet singh one year and then i think it was probably oh, it was singh and kakache at the same time for two years basically they kind of shared it and then it was sam sutton was like the standout dude and then it was ben wayne oh no then it would have been ben wayne then sam sutton then it was ben old up for grabs as to who it would be this year. Um, we'll see because the season is young. There's still only halfway through, but maybe it'll be Dan Mackay or Finn Conchie. We'll see. But these two guys, uh, one point being is they were like one of the two or three best players of their academy wave, like of their of their sort of year group coming through. They were at probably the best player um, each, unless you share it with each other. Like, they're good prospects and they're starting to figure it out at A-League level. Sutton already has, really. Um, yeah, you're, you're correct in your assessments of them, I think. Musical Jam, I just want to highlight uh, my appreciation for Currency. He's got two projects out right now that were, it's kind of hard keeping up with Currency releases, but that is the point here. Um, he's got two projects, two mixtapes, the 8-Ball Jacket and the 8-Ball Jacket 2, which is 
beautiful listens in themselves it's a lot of currency rapping over other people's like old older beats which is quite fun as well but to the my point currency has a lot of music that you can just play in the background and if you just want some uh good vibey hip-hop to chuck on in the background as you do something else there is hundreds of uh currency releases that you can go find out somewhere on any whatever platform you use and just jam some currency um obviously he's got a couple of projects with the alchemist producing um i think he did a project with freddie gibbs as well at one point but any currency release you're just getting some crispy hip-hop that you can enjoy and it kind of never fails that's that's what i want to point out here is that it's just bankable bankable hip-hop that you can trust and enjoy your musical jam wild card um well the new arctic monkeys album got me listening to old arctic monkeys albums <laughs> in a funny way um so there's that that's not quite the spirit of like new releases that we tend to do with these things but that's part of what i've been listening to there's also a um there was a how would you describe it? I guess a tribute album um, that sort of Slater Kinney, the band, put together like of just a different artist covers one song from their uh, 1997 classic album, Dig Me Out, which is one of my favorite albums of all time. The tribute album was like a lot of tribute albums where it's like one song is really good, one song is not so great, one song is kind of boring, one song is decent, but like it sort of varies drastically from artist to artist that was interesting but more importantly it got me listening to the to the original album um there's a dry cleaning album out english uh i guess indie alternative type of rock band they're very cool very much in that same mold of like a uh, band like wet leg or um there's a few few good bands um from england doing stuff like that at the moment so that new dry cleaning one is i haven't heard it yet but i'm i've got it ready to go um uh, maybe get to that this afternoon and kiwi indie rock band hans puckett have their their i don't think it's i think it's his second album is coming out on friday so not out yet but uh imminently awaiting that one because the the lead single was very good and i'm hoping that one's you know on par with their debut which was also top notch back it up yourself Raise your mana, Kia Kaha, stay beautiful. We'll be back on Thursday with another episode of the Niche Cast. Lots of black caps will be reviewed, previewing some Rugby League World Cup important games, which is uh, exciting, let alone any other Aotearoa sporting goodness. Raise your mana, stay beautiful. Ciao, ciao.